Well, good morning. Glad to have you all with us. Uh, if you're watching us uh, via Facebook Live, uh, my name is Bill Wynn. I'm the lead pastor here at Grace Communion Hanover. And uh, we meet at 7300 Hanover Green Drive in Old Town Mechanicsville. So if you're in the area, we would love for you to come and worship with us. We worship at 1030. And then, uh, of course, we have a, a main message at uh, 11 o'clock. So <clears throat> if you don't mind, join me in a prayer. Father in heaven, you have given us the keys to heaven. You've given us the keys to the kingdom. You've given us everything that you have. You have held nothing back from us and uh, have invited us to participate with you in your life with your son in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord Jesus, as we walk this out hand in hand with you, we ask for a fuller experience of it. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to tutor us in the ways of love so that we can call out beauty and love in those around us. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> I've got a uh, memory verse for us today, uh, if you can believe it. I remembered the memory verse. And it is Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And this is Jesus asking the disciples a question. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So that's an important verse for us to memorize. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. All right. So Jesus asked the disciples a question. Uh, the, the question is, who am I? Who do, you, who do people say I am? Who do you think I am? And it was an interesting context because this was right after the feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus had just performed, I don't know, on a scale of 1 to 10, I mean, how would you rank this miracle? He took five hush puppies and two fried herring and fed 5,000 people. I'd, I'd give it a, would you say a 9.5 on a scale of 1 to 10? It's probably more like a 50 on a scale of 1 to 10. It's amazing, isn't it? What if you had been there and seen that? Anybody ever ha seen a miracle? Or, or been part of a miracle? I have. I've seen miracles. I've seen, I've seen things that I couldn't explain. I mean, like, could not explain. I mean, things that, that later may, made me lie awake at night wondering if I was crazy. Like, did that happen? Did I see that? Surely, the disciples were talking about this thing. Who is this person? Right? Good gracious. I mean, that was the conversation in the boat, right? Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? It was extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. Unearthly what happened. I'm going to begin reading <coughs> in, um, in verse 13. And, and uh, the pericope heading in my Bible says, Peter's declaration about Jesus. And again, this is after Jesus had fed the 5,000. And, of course, he, wasn't, he didn't just feed. That wasn't his only miracle that day, right? Do you know the story? They hung around for a long time afterwards because what was Jesus doing after he fed all these people and preached the sermon that he preached? He was healing. That's what he did. I mean, there were a lot of people that came to Jesus that didn't believe who he was. They didn't believe that he was who he said he was. They didn't believe the things that he said. But they knew that he could make sick people not sick people anymore. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't care what you believe or who you say you are. You can walk in a room and tell me you're a fried egg. And if I have a deformity or an illness that you can heal, I don't care if you think you're a fried egg. I don't. I don't. I'm not going to care. I am not going to care. I had a tooth pulled recently. It was a wisdom tooth. And uh, it, it got broken. I won't tell you how it got broken, but if you want to know, ask me privately. But you have to promise not to tell anybody. So I go in to get this, this, and this wisdom teeth had been broken and it had been hurting me every day, all day long since April. 
But I was just, it was an upper wisdom tooth, and I, you know, I did that thing that you're not supposed to do, but I did it, right? I went on the internet, and I started reading. And I heard all these horror stories about, you know, the, sometimes the roots go into the sinus cavity, and then you got to have a bone graft. And all I could see was dollar signs. And I just kept thinking, maybe it'll get better, right? Maybe, maybe it'll just die and fall out. I don't know what, what I'm not a dentist. I don't know what tooth teeth do. The only thing I knew about that tooth was it was hurting me every single day. And so finally, all right, I'm, I'll go. I was praying about it, and, and I just heard the Lord saying, would you just go have the tooth out? Just go have the tooth out. It's going to be fine. Trust me, it'll be fine. And so I called a place, and they said, well, we, we couldn't see. I mean, it was hurting me that one day. I mean, it was hurting me so bad. That's why I was praying about the tooth, you know, right? You don't pray about the tooth because there's a few days here and there it wouldn't hurt. And I'm like, oh, good, it's working. You know, if I just ignore it, it'll go away. And so one day it was hurting so bad I started calling around. And you know how it is when your tooth hurts and you call somebody and you're like, well, we probably couldn't see you for about a month, you know. And how soon would you like to come in? I want, I'm on the way, right? I'm in the car. I'm calling you from the car. I'm coming now because I need this tooth out of my head. No, can't see you for two or three. We'll call you back if there's an opening. Nobody calls back. And so this tooth is just hurting and hurting and hurting and hurting. And finally... One day I call this place, first place I call that day, and, they go, and the lady, it's on a Friday, she goes, well, how soon would you like to come in? I said, I don't know, sometime in the next 10 or 15 minutes would be great. And she laughed, and she goes, well, the, the soonest we could see you is Wednesday at 1030. And I couldn't believe it. Like, are you kidding me? Everybody else is telling me three, four weeks out, you know, and I just give up. Okay, I'll see you. I'll, I'll probably be there at 8, you know, just in case. And I'm bringing donuts and coffee for everybody in the whole office. I'm so happy to have this. So I go in, and I'm, I'm expecting this giant bill. So I do the x-rays. They look at the tooth before they tell me how much it's going to cost, right? Because I, I guess it's like they want to peek under the hood and see how bad the damage is before they give you an estimate on repairing the vehicle. So the doctor looks at the x-ray, and he's like, oh, well, that wisdom tooth only has three roots, and they're real kind of shallow. So he says, G go up front, and they'll, they'll get you squared away. So I go up front, and the, the ladies, you know, she at the dentist, she, it's not a dentist. It was a, the, the only place it would take me was this oral surgery place, which that already sounds expensive, doesn't it? Like dentist, yeah, okay, well, I can handle a dentist. Oral surgery, oral and facial surgery was it. So he looks at the x-ray, he, he tells the lady, and she does the paperwork, and she comes up, and with my dental insurance and everything, it cost me $77 to get that tooth out. And I went back to this waiting area, and I was just kicking myself like, golly, I can't believe from April until today I have been fretting about, not fretting about the pain. I have pretty high tolerance for pain, right? Pain, manageable, right? And I don't take a lot of ibuprofen stuff, you know. I've, I've only got two kidneys. I want to keep them working, that kind of thing. But manage to, you know, function with this tooth hurting all the time. And then I find out it's $77 to have this tooth out. And then, they, they of course, they ask, you know, ahead of time, do you want to be sedated or do you want it local? Well, which one sounds cheaper to you? Yeah, so do it local. And they're like, are you sure? It's like, yeah, I've done this before, right? I've had dental work done with just luck. I've never been knocked out for dental. I've been knocked out, but never on purpose, right? I've earned it a couple of times, but, but I've never said, hey, knock me out, right? So anyway, um, Buddy Clark, if you ever meet Buddy Clark, ask him about first day of ninth grade uh, when he knocked me out. But anyway, um, so... <laughs> They do the local, and then I have to wait like 10 minutes for it to really kick in. They want, it, they want to make sure it's... The doctor came in and pulled that tooth in less time than it took for the anesthesia to kick in, for the local anesthesia to kick in. I, the, a song... You remember Wilson Phillips? Remember that group from the 90s? They're, they had a song called Hold On. That was playing. They had this radio in there, and that song was playing, Hold On. 
And I mean, I was holding on because while he was trying to pull this tooth out of my head, I mean, my head was, he was pushing my head all over the place and the nurse had her knee up on the chair and she's trying to hold my head. I'm, not, I'm trying to hold my head still. And, and literally before that song was over, the tooth was out and the pain was gone. It was amazing to me. That's nothing. That's nothing compared to the miracles that Jesus did. I consider that a miracle. Somebody with the, with the knowledge and the skill and the training to extract a tooth and eliminate this issue, this painful issue from your life. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't care anything about the, the doctor when he came in. I didn't ask him where he was born, didn't ask him where he came from. You ain't from up north, are you? I didn't ask him any of that stuff. You know, I didn't ask him about his pedigree. I mean, where your where your where your grandparents find up standing. You know, wh- didn't care. So there were a lot of people that came to Jesus for healing, for doctoring, that didn't believe who he said he was. And Jesus didn't mind, did he? How many times in the Gospels do you think Jesus ever turned someone away who asked for healing? How many times do you think he said no? Never. There is never a time. So Jesus has just fed 5,000. We're in, again, in Matthew 16, verse 13. He's just fed 5,000 people. He's just done all these miracles. He's healed all these people. And now he's taking his disciples away for that debrief, right? Like we talked about, the hot wash, the, the alone time. And they're headed to Caesarea Philippi. So the Roman Empire at the time was broken into four major districts, and um, the the guy in charge, Philip, the guy in charge of that district, because there were two Caesareas, one um, closer to the Mediterranean, but that's why it was called Caesarea Philippi. He sort of put his name on it, because he was in charge of that um, part of the Tetrarch. So they're they're going over there. By the way, and I have a map. Can we put that map up in both places if it's possible? that they're going to they're going to go so as they're walking along what do you think they're doing this is the debrief time right whenever they would stop and eat whenever they would stop to rest i mean can you imagine i mean i know for me personally um times in my life when i've had one-on-one time with mentors and and people that were more knowledgeable and um more skilled at, at, as theologians than me, time, time, time alone with those kind of people is valuable. It's not to be squandered, right? So they are they are on a two, at least two-day, maybe three-day journey with Jesus walking to Caesarea Philippi where they have all kinds of time to talk. What I want you to know in that is we have a paragraph out of that three-day walk. And I would hazard a guess to say that almost everything in that conversation was would be worthy of, of being shared. Well, you, do you remember what John said? John said, hey, if I wrote down everything that we learned from Jesus, the volumes would fill the earth. So <laughs> Matthew, uh, here in, in chapter 16, gives us this story. Mark, in chapter 8, gives us uh, a similar account. And then uh, Luke, I believe it's in chapter 9, gives us this account. Matthew's, I think, is a little more thorough. It includes more information, so I decided to use that one today. Um, So when Jesus came to the, the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? All right, boys, you're out there in the streets. What are they saying about me? 
And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. And at this point, you know, John the Baptist had been beheaded. His head was a gift to Herod's wife um, for her birthday. Uh, John the Baptist caused an, an, an immense amount of trouble for Herod. And so, you know, I guess every good wife wants to see their husband a little more stress-free. So she asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter for her birthday. <coughs> so they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, um, or one of the other prophets. And you have to understand that the Jews of the day believed in something called the transmigration of souls. They believed that the soul of a, and not just anybody, but an important person, maybe somebody that God was using in a profound way, that, that God wouldn't just waste that soul you know that's a good soul i was doing some good stuff with that and doggone it they died and i couldn't do anything about it you know it's a bizarre way of thinking and that the god would reuse that soul by putting it in somebody else and so they're thinking that maybe this is what's happened and this is who jesus is a lot of people thought that and he said to them but who do you say i am ah now we get the segue jesus asked them who do, the, who do those folks out there, who do, who, what's, the, what's the buzz? Who do they think I am? And he uses that to transition into this question that he wants to ask the disciples. Who do you say I am? And they said, um, Peter answers, you are the Christ. Or it, the, the word is Messiah. You give Bob a hand. The word Messiah, uh, Christ, means Messiah. It means Savior. And um, Jesus responds by saying, and Jesus answers him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Well, that's amazing to me. Peter calls it out. He says, you're the Messiah. This is huge, um, and it's, it's not something that had its origin in Peter. He didn't come up with that. He didn't come up with that revelation on his own. Uh, do you think Peter was a little sharper than the rest of the guys in the group? What about James and John? They were, they were at least as sharp as Peter. I mean, those were, the, those were the three that Jesus invested more of his time in, right? I mean, he had hundreds of disciples, of the hundred, he had 12 that went with him everywhere he went. And then inside the 12, he had these three that he was pouring into more intently than the, other, the others in the group. So, no, Peter's not sharper than anybody else in the group. I mean, that can't possibly be the answer for this because Jesus just said it's the Father. The Father revealed that. Now, how did the Father do it? Did the Father go around behind Jesus' back? And tell him, hey, look, Jesus probably is not going to like this. Or, or I tell you what, we're going to surprise him. I'm going to tell you who Jesus is. No, the, Jesus and the Father mutually indwell one another. They're on the same page. They have the same plan. They have the same goals. There's, a, there's never a time when the communication breaks down between Jesus and his Father in the, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. No, of course, the Father revealed this to Peter in the person of Jesus Christ. So, and I tell you, this is verse 18, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, very often, very often, we, we, are, um, we are told that this is the institution of the first pope, that Peter is the first pope, and that the church is founded on the apostle Peter. And here's how you know that isn't true. There's, there's several reasons uh, that we know that's, that's not quite the case. Um, if Peter had, I mean, you remember when, when Paul called Peter out and corrected him, right? Because he was adding the law back on to grace. Well, if if Peter was the honcho, then Paul would not have corrected him. But here, here's the chief reason we know 
that the church is not founded on Peter. When Jesus says, and I tell you, you are Peter, the word that is written is Petros. It's a Greek word that means pebble. <laughs> it means pebble. It means small, portable rock. It's the kind of rock you would put in your pocket, right? Have you ever found a rock that was just, I don't know, it was pretty, had some colors in it, and you pick it up, and you, maybe you wipe off some of the dirt, and you put it in your pocket. I have a friend um, that does that. They'll go out and pick up rocks, and they, he's got a tumbler. You put the rocks in there, and sometimes they're in there for a month, and they get all shiny and pretty, and they're not worth a whole lot but they're really pretty, and it's a lot of fun to go out and walk around, and they call it rock hounding. Well, Peter's a little rock like that. Petros means tiny, portable rock. So think about what is, what is Jesus, how is Jesus going to share ministry with Peter in, in, the, in the years forthcoming? He's going to send him around like a tiny, portable rock. Then he says this, and on this rock I will build my church. New word, different word. Not Petros, Petra. You know what Petra means? It means cornerstone. Immovable. So who is the cornerstone? It's Jesus. So if this helps, you can imagine that Jesus and the disciples are standing there and he says, who do, who do folks say I am? Well, some people think you're John the Baptist, and some think you're Colonel Sanders, and some, I was just seeing if you were awake. And some say you're, <laughs> some say you're uh, Elijah or one of the other prophets, right? And Peter speaks up, because Peter's, you know, he's my guy. That's, uh, Peter has a personality. I mean, Peter and I would have, we'd have gone out for beers together, I'm sure of it. And... Um, Peter is the ready, fire, aim type of personality, right? And Peter speaks up and says, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. And Jesus says, "On," he says, you are Petros, little tiny rock. So, so imagine that Jesus, Jesus puts his hand out towards Peter and says, you are little tiny rock Petros. And on this rock, now imagine Jesus pointing at himself. On this rock, I will build my church. Well, I don't know about you, but if I'm standing there and Jesus calls me little tiny rock and then calls himself the cornerstone, I'm going to hear that I'm a chip off the old block. <laughs> Peter had to have been immensely encouraged. And he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So for many years, I thought this meant that, okay, we don't have anything to worry about in the Christian church because here Jesus is saying that the gates of hell, the devil, will never beat the church. Well, that's not what he's saying. Not even remotely close to what he's saying. When Jesus says the gates of Hades, when he says the gates of hell, he is referring to the grave. What's about to happen to Jesus? I mean, did, did, he, did he not know? Of course Jesus knew. And he's letting the disciples in. Not even my death, he says, will stop the church from growing, from spreading throughout the world. Not even my death. I mean, the, the, um, the concept, or may, maybe we say the this, the the prospect of hell prevailing or overcoming anything that Jesus does well golly that's not even a question that's that's not even a, fa a factor it's not even possible right it's like walking into a daycare with a bunch of three-year-olds you know and you're a you're a, a grown person and you're saying boy I hope these kids don't gang up and kill me I'm a gang of three year it's that's that's a nonsense question. Hell doesn't even rank as a three year old anymore. Jesus has overcome the death, the grave, the devil, all of it. He's overcome all of it. 
It's not even a question. So he's not saying that I'm in a war with the devil and I'm going to win. He's saying not even my death can stop my church. I will build my church. And he says, and I'm going to give you the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be, will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So this concept of the keys to the kingdom of heaven, that means that whatever they bind on earth or bind in heaven has already been bound on earth or bound in heaven. Because where do the keys come from? The keys come from heaven. And they're not like keys to unlock, like you got to have this key. It's like secret knowledge, like the Masons or something. you got to possess some sort of secret knowledge or a secret handshake. No, these are, not, these are not keys that allow you entrance. You belong to Jesus. You live and move and have your being in Jesus. You're, the, the language of the New Testament is never about who's in and who's out. In the incarnation, Jesus takes humanity into himself. We're all in. Some of us are walking around with our hand over our eyes, complaining about darkness. Some, some, okay, so C.S. Lewis says it this way. Uh, Heaven will be populated entirely by saved sinners, and hell will be populated entirely by saved sinners. We're all in Jesus. I mean, that's John 14, 20. In that day, you will know that I'm in my Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. So think about it logically. Jesus says, in that day, you will know. Not in that day, it will happen, or it will become. So you can't know something that isn't already real, right? T.F. Torrance, in his reply to, um, I think it was James Barr, said, um, syntax comes... Uh, um, syntax, I'm sorry, I'm going to mess this up. Uh, I, I think it goes, syntax comes before semantics. Or, or no syntax contains its own semantics. That's how it goes. Sorry. We can edit that out later. No syntax contains its own semantics. In other words, realities come before words, and words are used to describe them, not the other way around. Right? So when Jesus says, in that day you'll know that I'm in my Father, he's not saying that when you know it, it will become real. It's already real. That's the only way you can know it. I mean, a, a newborn baby, if a newborn baby could talk to you, like it's, it's born three minutes, it's born, and maybe, maybe these parents have decided they're not going to name the kid just yet. Right? That's a thing. Right? Sometimes you don't name the kid right away. You wait a few days, and sometimes you get a better idea based on how it looked at you the first time or how the child, I don't know. What if you ask the kid what their name is? They don't have a name yet. Well, I don't, I don't know my name. Don't have a name. Haven't named it yet. You can't know something until it's already real, until it's already a reality. Jesus says, I'm in my Father. Someday you'll know that. And then he says, and then you'll also know that I'm in you and you're in me. So think about it logically. If I'm not in Jesus until I believe, if Jesus is not in me until I believe, then Jesus is not in his Father until I believe. And I'd bet my Spanish land grant that Jesus was in the Father long before I came along. These are... The, imperative, the, the indicatives of the gospel. The indicatives of the gospel are the things that are already true. The imperatives of the gospel are what we do about it. The keys to the kingdom are already yours. The question is not whether or not they're yours. The question is, what are you going to do with them? What are you going to do with the keys to the kingdom? And the keys to the kingdom in this metaphor, Jesus is not saying it's a magic trick to unlock some blessing. It's authority. It's a symbol of authority. You have kingdom authority, right? Like, I don't, I don't know how to use my kingdom authority to extract a tooth, to just command that tooth to fall out and, you know, I'll expectorate it onto the ground and, you know, kick it under the leaves. I don't know. It might be a thing, but I don't know how to do that. But I do have the kingdom authority to overcome the fear of going to the dentist. 
You know, the, the, the fear of the dentist, I, th I think that's a misnomer. I don't think many, I don't think most people are afraid of the pain uh, in their mouth from going to the dentist. I think they're afraid of the pain in their wallet from going to the dentist, right? Because I was having some work done one time, and the, and the first thing this, this uh, hygienist asked me, are you allergic to anything? I said, yeah. The, and the dentist was already in the room. I said, yeah, I'm allergic to pain and spending money. And the dentist goes, boy, are you in the wrong place? <laughs> He said, because this is going to hurt. It's going to cost a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for that. I hope that wasn't supposed to be a pep talk. But um, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then it will finish this way in verse 20. He sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone what they knew, that he was the Messiah. It was too late. It was too late for the nation of Israel. And any... Anything the disciples did to proclaim that he was the Messiah outside of their circle would have just complicated things, I think. According to most of the commentaries, that's the consensus on why he said don't tell anybody. Don't get the cart ahead of the horse. The, the plan was for Jesus to go to the cross. And there was, no, there was no good purpose served in the disciples trying to warn everybody that, no, he is the Messiah, don't kill him. The disciples at that point did not yet know that Jesus was going to be crucified. But Jesus knew as soon as they found out, they wouldn't be happy about it. And as you read along further in the story, you find that to be the case. No... Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the, what? World, right? I think I've told you before, there used to be a sign on uh, Interstate 95. Um, if you were headed north, just at the Whitaker's exit, there's a big blue sign with white letters, and it said, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, ask him to be yours today. And I laughed the first time I saw it. And uh, Davina, you know, we're riding in the car and I had the girl. She goes, what's so funny? I said, that sign. It says, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, ask him to be yours today. I was like, well, is he the Savior of the world or not? You know, it's like, mm, maybe we're in another dimension. Or we're not part of the world. You know, maybe they're reaching out to the people that are kind of like caught in between, you know, life and death or whatever. It's weird, isn't it, how we think. Is he the Savior of the world how about this? How about Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, trust him today. Follow him today. Believe that today. Not ask. It's, it doesn't make sense. You know, logic is not the antithesis of faith. Many things in our faith are not logical, but many things in our faith are. Let's pray together. We're going we're gonna, to um, share the communion of saints. For you guys on Facebook, you missed that. I dropped the, the covering over the, over the bread, but I caught it. It was an amazing save, but it doesn't get picked up on camera, so I just wanted you to know. All right, let's pray together. Father, um, Father God, we thank you for loving us so thoroughly and so generously. We thank you that um, you have withheld nothing from us. Every, every blessing, Lord, every blessing in spiritual places is ours. Teach us how to play well with what you have given us. Let us be generous with what you have given us in teaching others how to accept and receive the blessing of knowing you as we are known by you more and more every day. So, Lord Jesus, you are the great I am who only knows and will be known as the great I am that you are. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would increasingly, in giant measures, reveal that to us on the inside, in our inside houses where we are, uh, where we really live, and even in the, the, the dusty cobweb closets where we push away all the things that we're ashamed of, 
Meet us there, Lord, and heal us from the inside. And as we take this, the bread and the wine, we ask you, Jesus, to meet us in it anew. We pray it all in your name. Amen. So, yeah, we'll, we'll pass the elements. And um, if you, uh, you want to contribute or, or uh, give a gift financially, uh, you can do that by texting 804-409-0445. Or you can visit our website, <coughs> um, gchanover.org. And, of course, uh, there are envelopes in the back. And um, next Sunday is breakfast. We've been doing potlucks, and then uh, I think it was Elisa um, put a bug in my ear. We hadn't done a breakfast in a while. So we'll have bacon and eggs and, and uh, Kim's famous flapjacks and who knows what else, fruit and I don't know what we'll have. We'll have bacon, real bacon, right? Like sometimes, uh, you know, the, you hear people talk about turkey bacon. Well, that's, that's not a thing. Um, bacon is actually a cut of meat, like a T-bone. Where are you going to find a T-bone? You can only find it on one critter, and that's a steer, right? There's no such thing as a T-bone on a lamb. There's no T-bone on a hog. Well, bacon is the same thing. Bacon is a cut of meat, and you only find it on a hog. So if it ain't made out of hogs, it ain't bacon. Not to me. Not to me. <laughs> it's not. So, um, yeah, I know we go around and around about that here. But anyway, so next Sunday we're going to eat at 10 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, and we'll just have tables set up, and we'll probably leave all that stuff set up while we have church. Uh, it's a lot more fun that way. So this is the joy of Jesus in giving himself to humanity. And this is the laughter. This is the laughter of our Savior who laughs in joy at our salvation and in the face of the fall. Well, bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we'll see you next week.